10 to 6 on February the 16th, 2009, and we are about to set sail and begin our journey to Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> This is always a great feeling, and, you know, you've worked uh, so long to make this, these expeditions come together and suddenly here we are, we're, we're really going. Apparently when they have calm seas here, they call it Lake Drake because it's nice and calm like a lake, like a, just a regular <laughs> lake, but when it's really wavy and have the 12 meter waves and when we're all going to be sick off the side then it's called the Drake Shake. Oh, at the massive waves, yeah. water over the bow, the yeah. puking over this railing. Might as well. Not this one, side one. Yeah, well, let me know when that's going to happen to you. You'll be I'll right move, here. I'll, I'll be like, move far, yeah, far away. Yeah, make sure you put this in the film, okay? <laughs> Good morning, students on ice, and welcome to the Drake Passage. As advertised, the Drake has uh, been giving us a good ride since we left the Beagle Channel last night. I hope everybody's doing okay and got some sleep last night. Antarctica is an isolated continent, which means that all the waters around it have no interruption when they free flow around the continent in a clockwise direction. And so you've got the waters of the Pacific, the Atlantic, and the Indian Oceans, which are all converging down around the Antarctic. They are being forced around the uh, Antarctic continent, and they get forced through a tiny gateway that's only a thousand kilometers wide and that's the Drake Passage. The waters under the Drake Passage are about four kilometers but the, through the Scotia Arc which is an underwater mountain chain that comes up they actually get a bit shallower so they're about 2,000 meters in some places or only even a thousand and that makes all this water if you can imagine all this water that's going around the Antarctic being squeezed through a tiny little channel that's only a thousand kilometers wide and then it goes continuing around the Antarctic and that's why it's so rough. Please take care as you get out of bed and start to move around. One hand for the ship. part of the experience, you know? <laughs> it's good. As his fingers How are crossed Get a patch, get a patch. <laughs> patch works. Excuse me, I'm yeah. going to the bathroom. Seamus can walk a little better. <laughs> and we're hoping that the conditions will improve today. Uh, that's what the forecast is showing, so that's good. But we've got some albatross flying around the vessel. We're now uh, traveling uh, half the way on the Drake Passage and despite the conditions we've, we've been able to see a number of interesting birds. Uh, the largest of the flying birds, the wandering albatross and the royal albatross. Seen also a number of uh, black-browed albatross and um, an incredible amount of different petrels including white chin, cape or pintado petrel, uh, some uh, sheer waters fulmars, uh, blue petrels, and uh, some of the, the smallest ones, the prion and uh, stormy petrels, the Wilson storm petrels to be precise. So all these birds are adapted to a life in the ocean. This is uh, home, aside from how difficult it may look to us, this is where they spend most of their lives. And the only reason for them to go ashore is uh, to breed, because they obviously can't build a nest in these waters and uh, they go to uh, very 
uh, extreme areas where they find the conditions they need to breed and they're free of predators. But uh, the reason why they live here is because they rely on the wind to cover huge distances to be able to find their food. And there's always some wind in these oceans and so they can cover enormous distances, sometimes thousands of kilometers, to find a, a very good patch of food where they can uh, feed themselves and bring food back to the nest uh, for the chicks. to feed all of the life that we can see around us here. 